you know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Ferry Podcast, where I will sit down and converse with the superstars, the overachievers, the masters of our craft. Each episode will be a deep dive into their personal philosophies, their habits, the tools they use, and the secrets to not only their success, but overcoming failure as well. First, find somebody you can mimic, then find somebody you can stand, and then try to focus on one style until you master that style. So if you say, I can't do something, well, you're absolutely right. But if you say you're going to, you're absolutely right with that, too. People say that you shouldn't define yourself by your work. That is not true. You know what Dave Farley does when he's, you know, lucky enough to be at the World Equestrian Games? I'm watching other people work. Yeah. I don't think uh, we do that enough. This podcast is for all of you out there who share my passion for the job and the desire to always improve. These interviews will put you in touch with the inner workings of the role models we all want to emulate. So let's get to it. You know, there's only so many hours in a day, and it's a matter of what you do with them. Welcome, everyone. Today I'm speaking with Travis Burns, FWCF, CJF. I'm sure we are all in the same boat this summer as the months progress, busy as heck and just trying to stay on top of things. As that has been the case for me, I'm sure you've noticed that the frequency of podcast episodes has been a little bit lacking. I just haven't been able to maintain that same output that I did earlier on in the year. So I'm doing my best. We will keep putting them out there for you, but I had to prioritize a bit and and make sure that I stayed on top of things in my main job as a farrier. Travis had reached out to say that he'd been enjoying the podcast. He was just newly introduced to it. And I took that opportunity to ask him to be a guest. He's been on my hit list for quite a while, and it was just quite convenient that he had reached out like that. I know that wasn't his original intention. He was just being his usual nice self, but it worked out quite well for us. So I'll read you his bio before we start the conversation, just to give you a little bit more background. Travis Burns is an associate professor of practice in the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences at the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine at Virginia Tech. Travis is a certified journeyman farrier, CJF, with the Therapeutic and Educator Endorsements, TE and EE, from the American Farriers Association. He is also one of six Americans to become a fellow in the Worshipful Company of Farriers by examination from the United Kingdom, the FWCF. He currently serves as the Chief of Farrier Services in the Equine Podiatry Service of the Veterinary Teaching Hospital. He has served the American Farriers Association most recently as President and in the past as Regional Director, Chairman of the Education Committee, and Tester. He currently serves as an examiner for the Association's Certification Program. He attended Farrier School at the North Carolina School of Horseshoeing and received a bachelor's degree in animal science from North Carolina State University. Burns worked at North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine before entering into a one-year internship program at Forging Ahead, an elite multi-farrier practice in Northern Virginia. Upon completion of the internship program, He was retained at Forging Ahead as an associate farrier until joining the college in 2010. Since becoming a faculty member at the VMCVM, he has given more than 130 presentations to professional and lay groups nationally and internationally. His clinical and research interests include laminar morphology and hoof crack repair materials. As you will hear in our conversation, Travis lives up to his reputation for being a deep-thinking, well-spoken, and just generally kind guy. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. First of all, thank you for doing this, and I I really appreciate your time. After you reached out, you were on my hit list, and I had to take that opportunity and ask you. Well, that certainly wasn't my intent, but I I will admit I I stumbled across it. Uh, Some other affairs had told me about it. I I don't drive around a lot, but several people had told me that I really needed to check this one out. And you're somebody who's in a a very different position than most 
in working for the university, what is that like? You said you don't drive around a lot. That's very unusual for a farrier to say. Yeah, no, I'm I'm quite different. So I've I've been here for uh gosh, this is this is my 11th year now. So I guess like 10 and a half full years. I've been here and certainly in my career, obviously I've been a traditional farrier, you know, you have your truck and you drive around the country shoeing horses, but moving here, you know, it after I don't know, I can't remember, probably 2016, 2017, somewhere in there, I stopped traveling to farms. So I I do go to probably five farms that are kind of friends of the university. They're important stakeholders within the the college or the university. So I travel out to those farms. But other than that, everything I do hauls into a ferry shop here at the vet school. Okay. We have a truck, we have the ability to go out, but we don't. And it's for multiple reasons. Obviously it increases the profit margin. It makes us a little more efficient, but also it goes a long way to build a referral service or a referral network with the local farriers. They know they can send me the one horse they don't want to do or the one horse with a quarter crack or the one chronic laminitic or the one horse that has to be glued. They can send me all those cases and know that I will do that case, but I won't go to the farm. I won't take over. I won't start <laughs> yeah, doing more. Is- I won't critique. I think that goes a long way to building the the trust and and occasionally, you know, we get called out, you know, some laminitic that can't trailer or uh, a puncture wound that's actually standing on something that they don't want to leave the farm with. So we, we do go out for those type things. But by far and away, the vast majority of our cases haul in or we go to Virginia Tech does have about 100 horses of their own. So we travel to those three farms, but they're they're on campus. It's, you know, one of them is 100 yards out the back door from my farrier shop. The other one's maybe half a mile. And the other one's maybe a quarter mile away from it. They're all right here on campus. Oh, cool. So how did you end up where you are right now (laughs) in that position? Yeah. So I ended up here, I guess, like several other members have said on or interviewees have said on your podcast, I was in the right place at the right time. So I started out at kind of a convoluted path and I was an undergrad at North Carolina State University and, and I was working for their vet school. And by chance, like I was, I guess... Maybe a little in over my head sometimes, but but working through it. And really, the the thing that changed it was I was working with a resident on a on a case of particularly like a deep digital flexor tendon laceration that occurred at the pastern level, and so it was toe flipping, and and the horse really needed an extension out of the back from its heels, and so we built a little fishtail bar shoe by taking a normal shoe, a keg shoe, and modifying it and welding in a little insert. And like all residents, you know, you do that. We did that on a I can't remember, like a Saturday or a Sunday morning. And then the next day, uh, what happens is you always meet with your faculty member and you have rounds. So you meet with the faculty and the students and you discuss the case and what could be better, what went well, what went bad, you know, that kind of thing. Just reflect upon it and learn. Yeah. And I'll never forget the words. There was a surgeon in there and, and he said, honestly, it was a great job. We did an excellent job. The only thing that would have made it better is if it was a handmade shoe. <laughs> and he just said that like it was nothing. And and to probably 99.9% of the population, that wouldn't have bothered them. But to me, it irritated the crap out of me. <laughs> it forced me to, to self-reflect and realize I did not have the ability to hand make that at the time. And that really just irritated the crap out of me. And so about two weeks went by and I met with him and I realized I really enjoyed being in an academic world. I mean, I'm, I'm a nerdy kind of kid. And so I I enjoyed that atmosphere. I enjoy the collaborative uh, work. I enjoy the people that have such an interest and such an expertise in their individual fields. And so I knew that's where I wanted to be long term, but I also realized I needed to learn and, and become better. And so by happen chance, I met with him and he told me about a farrier up in Northern Virginia that uh, did a lot of that type work and was very similar to me in personality and, and encouraged me to reach out to him. And so I called him and talked with him and he asked me if I could come up on a Saturday for an interview. And so I did. And then, you know, while I'm there after about 10 minutes, after he stopped laughing at me for being in a, I was in a coat and tie. Like I thought it was a a formal interview Um, (laughs) after he stopped kind of laughing at me about that. You know, he offered, offered me a job. Him and his group had decided to start an internship program and recruit ferries from around the country to come and, and work with their group practice. And so I did. And by, just by happenstance, him and that group wound up, they were the farriers, well, they actually, they still are to this day. They're the ferries for something called the Marion DuPont Scott Equine Medical Center in Leesburg, Virginia. And that okay. is one of the three campuses that makes up the university I work for. So I work at Virginia Tech University, but I specifically work for the Virginia, Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine, 
which is a, a joint effort between Virginia Tech and the University of Maryland. And so they actually have three campuses. There's the one here in Blacksburg. There's one in uh, College Park in Maryland. And then there's this satellite facility in uh, Leesburg, Virginia. And so I was working for him and at that facility when they decided to hire a farrier here for the Blacksburg campus. And so I, again, just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I knew, I knew people. He made uh, a recommendation for me, applied for the job, and just got lucky enough to get it. But I have no doubt if I hadn't have been working for him in that facility, I wouldn't have been able to come here as, as young as I did. Right. So, and what sort of certifications would you have had at that point? I know you have more letters behind your name than a box of <laughs> alphabets, but. <laughs> no, I mean, at that time, man, I was just a little peon, man. I was just the fairy that would go anywhere and do anything for the group. And so at that time, I was just an AFA certified fairy when I, when I applied. Okay. In between when I applied and before I actually started here, I, I actually became an AFA certified journeyman farrier, but, but I was really appreciative. Actually, one of the job requirements for this position was you had to at minimum have AFA certified journeyman farrier certification under your belt. Right. And, you know, obviously the, the others that applied for this job, they all were journeymen. So I just happened to be lucky enough that they, they saw some promise and, and a future uh, in me. And again, and obviously I got it, got it done before I actually became employed by Virginia Tech. But, but I do appreciate that, uh, a vet school or a college or, or somebody like that looking for a farrier did make that a minimum requirement. I think that's a great sign for the profession and certainly a great sign for the, the American Fairs Association certification program to be recognized like that. No kidding. And then you've gone on, of course, to pursue others. What, inspired that? Uh, again, I have this weird little thing about me and I, uh, so obviously growing up and, and wanting to, to be a fair at an academic institution, something like this, naturally Mike Wildenstein is the, is the role model, right? Right. Yeah. So I wanted to do anything that Mike Wildenstein had done. So I'll admit I made the goal that I wanted to, to become an FWCF before I even knew what it was. I just wanted to do it because Mike did it. <laughs> You know, for someone in my position, like he, he is the cream of the crop. Like that's the one you want to be. And so yep. for me, even before I knew what it was, I obviously had that as a goal and, and an interest. And then, you know, naturally as you, you grow and you become exposed to those things, I, I do appreciate the English, I guess, system, training system. I, I do appreciate that. And I, I certainly do appreciate the way the tests are set up, you know, with a more in depth theory portion and, uh, no, you know, not taking anything away from the AFA certification system, but uh, but they do require more, uh, I guess, a bigger shoe display, a bigger display of your skills than are, are what is required for the for the AFA, and and they certainly recruit other aspects of the job like interactions with a vet, uh, lameness assessment or gait analysis. They include modern materials within their exams, uh, so I I naturally kind of lended myself towards it. But to just be blatantly honest with you. It was, I just wanted to be like Mike <laughs> and just not Jordan this time. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. No. Yep. So I guess we should backtrack. Were you a, a horse person growing up or? Oh, yeah. You have a relative, right? That you had an uncle or somebody who was a shoer? Yeah, yeah. What happened was I grew up really with just a single mom. So she's really the one that, that raised me. But being a part of a, a single parent household, naturally during the summer, I was uh, a liability. I was a little loose cannon that somebody needed to supervise. And <laughs> so what often happened is I would go spend the summers with my uncle who ran or managed a, uh, a riding stable in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And so that uh, entailed, you know, they the business was essentially you take horses out and you with tourists and you you just take guided, you know, one, two, three, five hour trail rides through the through the park. And so we grew up and they had, you know, depending on the time of year, on site anywhere between thirty and fifty horses. And so my uncle was kind of a part time farrier, so he would shoe all them either. Uh, that particular uncle, the the manager, or I had another uncle named Timmy who would help shoe. And then ultimately my dad, when he was uh, around would help shoe as well. So the three of them took care of the farrier care for, for those horses, which when you're trail riding eight and 10 
12 hours a day, you know, they go through a lot of shoes and no kidding. And naturally as a kid, I didn't realize why at the time, but, but now I certainly do. But at the time they didn't really want anyone around. So they would shoe early in the morning or shoe late at night. Uh, I wasn't allowed to, to be in the barn, you know, making a ruckus or doing anything at the time. You had to sit very still or, or not be there. And so naturally I became kind of interested in anything you told me, well, hey, you can't yeah. do or don't be Taboo. around. Yeah. Like I got to check out what's, what's happening here. And so, uh, that's really how I, how I got started was just, they eventually helped me learn to pull shoes, finish feet, kind of help them out once I showed an interest in, in doing it to a, a young boy. I mean, it, it looks really cool, you know, trimming and shoeing horses, you know, they're tied up sometimes. You know, the horses have to be done in stock. Sometimes they were heavily sedated, but there's a lot of noise. There's a grinder, you know, there's cool stuff happening. So <laughs> I thought it was cool. And that's really how I got interested in it. But I would say my family, they, not that they weren't supportive, but they, where I grew up in Western North Carolina, you'd be hard pressed in that type of rural area to make it as a, as a full-time farrier. So, uh, you know, they obviously had concerns about, well, whether that could be a lifetime career or not, but it's certainly the the thing I was most interested in. And, and again, I, I grew up with a single mom. Uh, she quit high school. And so when I went on to kindergarten, she went back, got her GED, eventually got a higher level certificate and then an associate's degree and then eventually a bachelor's degree. And so oh, wow. for her, there was no doubt like school was number one and I was going to college yeah. come hell or hot water. Like that was just never, never an option not to. And so even though I, I knew I wanted to be a fair, I wanted to trim and shoe horses, I had to go to, to college and, and certainly in college, I you know, like a lot of fairs, you know, thought about vet school. And, you know, the more I worked there, the more I volunteered, the more I spent time there, I realized the farrier part was the part that I was most interested in. Again, that's kind of how I became a farrier. Just, it was cool. <laughs> I was always around it. I mean, from the time I was a kid, I can remember horses getting shoes. There were always horseshoes laying around, always nails, always rasps. Those were just everyday life to me. Okay. I mean, I, I can't remember a part of my life where horses weren't involved in some capacity. Right. Now, how did you discover your hero, Mike? Oh, just through uh, books and stuff. And I obviously grew up before the big internet explosion and it was hard to get information. And so the information I, I would get would come from, well, it started out with catalogs. Like the NC tool catalog is a, is an excellent catalog and you know they, they have a little bit of information in in there at the time and then i somehow got on to the fairs journal and what was that other magazine there was ink and anvil is that the name of oh, it okay. was it anvil magazine one of those and and anyway so so mike was often often featured in there and you know just like a lot of other people so i had all these like I knew all these names, you know, you start working at a vet school, which, you know, I worked at NC state. And I think somebody would be foolish if you, if you start working at a university doing fair work, not to look at all the other universities. So the whole, right. the whole system is, is kind of a copycat thing. So there's, you know, whatever 30 vet schools in the U S and it's small enough. It's very collaborative. So you're constantly looking at the others and, and naturally Cornell kind of led it. They had a ferry the longest. There was Cornell and Penn. And so there was Mike Wildenstein and, and Rob Sigafoos at the time. And so those were the two that the average fair would know of. Sure, there were fairs working in all the others, but those two were often featured in like American Fairs Journal, things like that. Right. So I just became aware of them. And then you go out and then you start going to clinics and things and, and naturally being a part of the vet school. You know, I would go to farrier stuff, but I would also go to vet continuing education things like the International Laminitis Conference and things like that. And when you go there, the farrier speakers you see are either from Rudin Riddle or Mike Wildenstein. And so <laughs> Mike was a very a wonderful speaker. He, he came across as very intelligent. Mm -hmm. Again, when you see him from afar, you could see how somebody would want to emulate him. Yeah, for sure. He just kept popping up places and, and he seemed to be at the time, one of the longest tenured fairs within a vet school. I think him and Rob probably started about the same time, but Mike stayed at Cornell longer than Rob was at Penn. Okay. I have a friend who, an associate that works with me and she went to Cornell and she said, it's incredible how many little hand forged things you will discover all over the place. And it, they're all from him yeah. just from being there for years. Yeah. No, it's, it's quite remarkable. You go, go there and I, I visited there a couple of times and they're not really shoe racks. It's kind of just these long rails that would have just shoes 
upon shoes stacked upon them. And they were all, you know, therapeutic things. And, you know, looking back, you don't know, are those shoes that he made that he never put on or, or shoes that he made? And then the horse died for some reason, or maybe they were practice shoes, but there are shoes all over that place that were, were made <laughs> by him and they're beautiful. Great shoemaker. Yeah. Great period. As you would know, probably from the listening to the podcast, I finally got to meet him and, oh, excellent. and sit down for a chat. Yeah. So with a situation like your work situation, what is a normal day like for you? They can all vary. And so, you know, like today we went out and did a few university horses, shot a couple, flewed up some, come back here, did a horse after uh, it had an MRI. And so the vet team comes up with a, a diagnosis and kind of a, some treatment principles that they would like to achieve. And so we come and shoe the horse. But I would say here, most days are different. There are a couple of consistent things like Tuesday morning, we go out and trim broodmares and babies at the breeding operation here. Wednesday morning, we trim the research horses. Friday, we go to the riding program. Uh, Wednesday, we have uh, a vet that has a really strong foot focus, podiatry focus, uh, named Scott Pleasant. And that's the day he sees cases. So those are days with white line disease or chronic laminitics or quarter cracks or, or whatever. And then you're always on call. I shouldn't say on call, but you're, we're always here. And so the vets, when they, they have lameness exams or lameness cases that come in, you know, we're involved in trimming, shoeing those a horse with. Uh, acute laminitis come in, a horse that's here for cellulitis but develops contralateral limb laminitis. So we we may fashion pads for it. We may shoe it. Every day seems to be a little bit different this time of year. And then starting like when the students come back in August, you know, we, we have a pretty heavy teaching load. So, you know, most Tuesdays and Thursdays are spent in our equine podiatry course teaching the third year vet students uh, either in a lecture or a lab. And uh, starting in August, when the students come back, you know, we, we typically have at least one fourth year vet student on the service with us. So, you know, we're, we're going over reviewing cases with them, teaching them how to pull shoes, teaching them how to, you know, round up a brood mare, those, those type things. So, so every day is a little bit different, but we try to do those, those three things from clinical service to, to teaching. And then obviously, uh, outreach and research kind of things like this or, or helping with a research project. So, so every day is a little bit different. There's similarities between them. There's days that are easy to predict and some days you just don't know what's going to happen until you get here. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. So what are some of the things that you've seen from starting out? How long have you been there now? You said 11. I've been here for 10 and a half years. 10 and a half years. Okay. So have you noticed some major changes in your approaches to some things in that time or have the basics been the same and... The basics have been the same. I would say probably the biggest change over time, and, and certainly something I try to t talk to and teach younger fairies, is a, the approach to acute laminitis. So uh, when horses are first, when they're going through the developmental phase and the acute phase and they show a lameness, I, when I was much younger, would really try to find some way to shoe them. So I was convinced, you know, I could trim it in a certain way or I could apply this specific shoe. I could apply a hard bar or a W shoe or a glue on a reverse shoe or put in Equipack or strategically use impression material that I could do all these things that somehow I would make that horse sound. Right. And yeah. that became eventually soul crushing, right? The horse may be so painful that it's hard to pick up a foot for very long. Yeah. You know, sometimes we were blocked the limbs to be able to shoe it. Uh, we would apply a shoe and then the next day the horse is worse. And, and then at that time you don't know. Was it the shoe? Was it the trim? Was it the Equipack? Is it the pad? Is it the, the frog pressure? Is it a nail? Or is it just the disease process? And it, it kind of makes you crazy. You don't really know what's, <laughs> what's happening yep. and why, and you lose a lot of sleep. You know, so over time, I've realized that when a horse is in an acute bout of laminitis, there's probably nothing you're going to do trim or shoeing wise to make it comfortable. The cause of the laminitis needs to be addressed. And then the horse needs to, to stabilize, become comfortable. And then it's, easier to rehab their their feet around their distal phalanx. So I'd say our approaches, or at least my approach has really changed and went away from trying to apply something. And then essentially when they're in acute laminitis, we just apply frog and sole support somehow. So with soft ride boots or black foam pads or uh, using an impression material taped in the bottom of the feet, uh, the soft ride ice boots with frog and sole support, any number of those things to where they can easily be on and off. They can change. And again, nobody ever blames a boot with a pad. In it. Yeah. So if the horse is lame or worse the next day, then it's, it's definitely the disease process. It eliminates that big variable of, 
well, was it the shoe that was applied? Was it something about the shoe, the pad or whatever? Or was it the sheer act of putting it on? Any number of things could make that horse worse, right? And so yeah. this is a way that you kind of eliminate a big, big variable or a big group of variables. And you know, if the horse is worse the next day, it's, it's the disease process. It's progressing or, or something, but it's not, it's not the shoe anymore. Right. Yeah. And it makes it easier to live in that environment and certainly easier on your body. I mean, I'll admit I used to spend a lot of time, you know, making and fitting these shoes. And if you've worked on a lot of acute laminitics, it's hard to get them to pick up their feet. You have to hold, literally hold them up. You have to pull them up. Like it, it does take a physical toll on your body and it does take a physical toll on their body. So now, you know, the application of boots and, you know, impression material or closed cell foam pads, those are all easy. Well, I should say relatively easy. It's not easy. (laughs) Yeah. Easier than. Yeah. It's easier and less time consuming. Now, as a shoer in the hunter jumper world, I've seen the Stephen O'Grady talks and I've also seen the Denois talks. I'm kind of interested in what your opinions are on this whole idea of flotation. You mean like using wide things like so? Uh, yeah. The collateral ligament shoes or onion heels, Spencer shoes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, my, my take is, is we don't know really. Yeah. So, that's my take. Nobody knows how much width you need whether it be the toe or the branch or the heels or how much width you need to achieve the level of flotation that you desire in the given footing. Yeah. You know, I see it all the time here. There's a great degree of variation. So, I mean, you take the, the medial collateral ligament injury. It's easy to say, I want a wide, wider branch on the, the medial side. Well, you know, for me, a wider branch might be, you know, an extra inch or it might be a, a quarter by half insert that I welded on or, you know, anything. But but when you see uh, the variations in it, you see people that take Equipack and literally pour from one side of the frog all the way over. You see some people yeah. that cut a pad in half. You see some people that just slightly deep seat the one side and then grind the other side. You see people that cut out the other side and don't do anything to the normal side. So in my mind, there's a great deal of variation in it and no one really knows how much you need how much is effective how long it should stay on should it should that only just be used during the injury rehab phase should that be used forever no one knows and so i'll admit i i probably have more questions about it than than i certainly do answers well and that's why i was asking you (laughs) it's an area where there's a great deal of research opportunity and there are some people that are doing stuff with it like uh jenny hagan doing quite a bit with workmen over in, uh, is it Utrecht? Is she in Germany or is she at the university in the Netherlands? E- either way, her and workmen are partnered together. You know, workmen has supported some research with her and, and try and determine the effects of the medial lateral or dorsal palmer uh, kind of flotation and the effects on the joint capsule or the orientation of the distal phalanx within the hoof capsule or the orientation of the coffin joint angle. Mm-hmm. So there is some research being done, but I think there's a lot of uh, questions and, and things to, to be answered. In theory, it all makes a lot of sense to me, right? Like, yeah. you know, you want to spare the one one collateral ligament. So you want to reduce the, the amount of, I guess, what would be called tension on it. But do we know, do they hurt from compression mm-hmm. or is all the pain come from tension on that ligament? And so there's two, two very different things there. So if it, if they hurt during compression, then the wide web would be horrible for them. But if they hurt during tension, then the, the wide web would be good for them. Right. Uh, no one's answered that question for me, <laughs> but I've been accused of asking a lot of questions. So I think that's a good thing. <laughs> As somebody who's in the position you are, do you find that you're getting all of this cutting edge research sort of fed to you? Is that a fairly common thing for you? Um, yeah, I don't know if fed to you is a good term, but uh, so it's not like somebody is here, you know, mandating, hey, Travis, did you read this? That that kind of thing. But you okay. do inevitably in this world, you know, being here in academia, you can't pop off and say anything without somebody asking why. And yeah. do you have justification? I mean, you can't just pop off and say, well, you know, I think every horse should be barefoot. I mean, you can say it, but 20 people are going to ask you why. <laughs> yeah. They want to know with evidence as to why. So if you want to make a stance on anything, like if they bring a, a horse down here with navicular disease and I want to put a wedge pad on it, I better know why I want to put the wedge pad on. You know, so you you have to have justification for those things. So naturally, 
the peer reviewed research is where you, where you go. And, and luckily being a part of a, a university, you have pretty much unlimited access to it. Yeah. So it's really hard outside the university to get a hold of journal articles and, and the, the research that's out there. It's, it's too costly. I mean, you can spend $30 on one paper. And which you don't even know for sure if that's the paper you wanted. You just read an abstract and then you pay your 30 bucks and you get it. And so having access to it from a university standpoint is one of the tremendous benefits to being here. But there are ways that it is fed to me. So if you, if you're aware of friend Yurga and her, uh, hoof search, she does publish yep. a thing every month with all the research or, or patents or anything that's kind of been out there in that month on, uh, hoof care or farrier or anatomy of the distal limb or biomechanics or laminitis, any of those things. And she has, you know, titles and abstracts in them all. And then all you got to do is if you have access to the literature, you just click the button and read the article. And so I, I'll admit, I mean, I do spend a lot of time reading and, and in this environment, you do have to, to stay up to date on it because there are new residents every, every other year. And they want to know, they want to know answers to their questions and, and they are up to date with the literature and you, you better be as well or you right. just look like a fool. Yeah. And how was that in the very beginning? That must've been very intimidating. Even going in as a CJF, uh-huh. you have a certain level of knowledge for sure. But then I'm going through the process of learning what it takes to do the AW and my fits. Yeah. And it's like a, this whole other level of, of knowledge that you have to acquire. Mm-hmm. How was that in the beginning? I, I think for a lot of people, it's overwhelming. For me, I don't know. There, there's a couple of things. I think in the moment, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, exactly. You're kind of ignorant to what is what is out there in the world. You're just not not aware of it. You're not conscious of it. So it's almost in the in the time you have a, a little bit of blind confidence because you don't know <laughs> the level of knowledge that is out there. And so that helps with some of the intimidation. Uh, to a certain degree. And then also for the people that know me, it's, you can't offend me by asking why, or can you explain or things like that? Like I, I've been that way my entire life. It does bother some other people. Like I, I irritate some people sometimes when I'm asking why, or can you explain, or what, what was your reasoning behind that? I've never perceived those questions as accusatory, or I know the answer, but I want to know if you know the answer. Like I, I have a genuine curiosity right. for for knowing why to a lot of things. And so even coming here, it's like, you know, if someone knew more than me, which a lot of them did, I didn't look at it as a time of that was a deficit on my part. I mean, sure it it was, but I looked at it more as, well, it's just an opportunity for me to know and learn more. And I was very lucky when I got here. Like I said, there's a surgeon here who also went to Ferris School in the 80s named Scott Pleasant. And he was a wonderful, wonderful supporter of the podiatry service or the farrier service and, and getting me here. And so, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I told you he didn't, I mean, he helped coach me up. He, he would give me historical things to read. Uh, he would invest time in me sitting and going over radiographs or images or PowerPoints or anything. You know, I mean, he showed me how to find uh, the literature, how to do a search, how to go through PubMed, what journals are, are good, like EVJ and EVE and uh, how to get my hands on these things. And so he really opened doors and, and helped me with things. And and I'll admit the the time I got the most intimidated was one of the first talks. You know, you go and give a, a clinic or a talk at uh, anything from a vet or a farrier continuing education event. There's always the one guy or the one girl that really is just there to ask you some question or talk about something just to make themselves feel smarter, just to kind of challenge you and go after yep. you. That person's yep. always in the crowd. And I knew that yeah. having been to a lot of things. And I'll admit, I was a little worried about it, but I'll admit Dr. Pleasant put me at ease because he went to a lot of those first things with me. And he's like, if that happens, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And it was nice, you know, sometimes when you are up there as the speaker and somebody asks you a question, I mean, if you're speaking as a 28 year old to a room full of vets that have been vets for 40 years and they ask you some question about, well, what was the original studies that determined the effects of heel angle and uh, the stresses and the strains on the, the deep digital flexor tendon? Well, it was nice to be able to say, well, I, I don't know, but Dr. Pleasant may, and he would stand up and explain it. It was awesome. Like the, the support I got from him and, and coming here is beyond describable. Me being a ferry here would not have been anywhere near as successful as it has been without his his help and support. That's incredible. And you actually take on apprentices there, don't you? We do. 
Yep. How would somebody listening to this approach that? Well, there's a couple of different ways. So like, how would they uh, like prepare themselves to come here or how would they apply for the job? Well, both, I guess. Well, so we do, there's a couple of different ways we've, we've done it, different permutations and and so right now we do have a, a paid apprenticeship program. So we, I hire one intern for the year and I've had several in the past and I'll admit I've just advertised it through the American Fairs Journal and then obviously the Virginia Tech job sites. And, and it's just a kind of a simple job application. You produce a resume, answer some, some questions, that kind of thing. And then, you know, we go through an interview process and, and pick the one we want, but I would say not to sound egotistical, but I think it's fairly known within the, the fair industry. If you know about this program here, you know that we've, we have somebody else here every year besides just me. You know, I, I came from a group fair right. practice and I, I really believe in having multiple people around it. It makes the service work better. It provides, uh, I guess, better clinical service to the patient. So it helps the overall healthcare of the horse, but it also, like we were talking about having access to those, to that intellectual property, those, those type of things, it's self, it would be selfish on my part not to try to expose other farriers to that. So, so we've always had someone here since, uh, I guess the first one came in sometime in 2012 and we've had at least one other person, if not two or three other people here every year since. Okay. And I guess it's the same situation where the questions they ask, just like the residents, I'm sure that actually increases your learning as well. Right? Oh, it does. There's nothing in this world that will teach you more than having to explain to somebody why you do something. You can't just say, well, yeah, I crack a toe, I'll put a toe bend in it. They're going to ask you, well, how do you make <laughs> sure it is centered? I mean, they, they yeah. ask you down to the finite detail how to do things. And as you're trying to explain it, you do have to break it down to a certain certain level for them to, to be able to understand it. So you have to have a really good understanding yourself of whatever topic or, or technique you're thinking of to be able to clearly articulate it so they can learn from it. Yeah, for sure. They ask a lot of questions and vet students ask even more questions. I bet. But it, I think it's great. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's people who are as equally curious as you were, which is why you're all there. Right? Yeah, ab absolutely. No, I mean, in this building, there are nothing but highly intelligent people that are extremely interested in their field of expertise. Yeah. It's unreal. The, the tale that they go into and the knowledge they have on their specific topic or field. It's amazing. It must be. Now in the process of approaching all of those exams and practicing for them. How did you go about that? Especially carrying a full-time job. I know often that's a hindrance for people, right? Is the fact that they have a job and a family and all these other commitments. It is. How did you make it work? So I, I would say at the, the time of those exams, I wasn't married. Sure, had girlfriends, but I was a single single man. So you have to have the time. Now, now I have a wife and a child. I can't imagine having the, the time to prepare for those things at the moment. <laughs> but at the time, I, I had the time and I, I had the opportunity. When I did the FW, my, well, she was my girlfriend then, but my now wife was a, uh, a resident. So she had an even more workload than I did. So that afforded me oh, the wow. time to practice and do things. But I, I've always been one to incorporate it into everyday life. So again, I mean, if you want to practice making shoes, we'll make them for the horse, put them on. I did a lot yeah. of, of that on the, on the job. And then uh, I'll admit I spent a lot of hours uh, in the forge alone, just making shoes. Looking at me, that was the part I needed to practice and, and develop more. Uh, as far as the oral exams, the written exams, the being questioned by a vet or a farrier panel, I mean, hell, for me, that's, that was just everyday life. Yeah, that was your job. Yeah, that was nothing new. So I don't get intimidated by uh, examiners in a white coat. It doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. That And again, like I said, I've, I've never taken offense to, well, why? Or can you explain more? Like I never took that as a trick question or someone trying to discourage you or, or trying to prove that they knew more than you. So for those exams, you know, it's the oral exam and the intimidation factor that really bothers a lot of people, you know, cause they're, they're going to continue asking yeah. you questions until you say, I don't know, or you go so far down a rabbit hole that you can't get out. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not going to stop until then. Like the more knowledge you give them, the more they're going to keep asking. And so to me, it just, I, I lucky having been here in this environment for, for so long when I took those tests, it, it didn't bother me. I was more bothered and more worried about the, the simple thing like burning up my shoe in a Coke fire. Like I was more worried about that 
than the oral exam or the, the written exam. Because the way they run their exams, they're, they're open-ended on the, the written part. It's not that you're just picking A, B, C, or D. You know, I mean, you just write out what you know and explain it and think yeah. about it from multiple different points of view. So if they ask you, well, how do you treat acute laminitics? Well, hell, I mean, as long as you could defend it, you could talk about putting on boots or you could make a case for putting on heart bars or you can make a case for gluing on reverse shoes or you could make a case for anything, really, you know, as long as you could defend it and back it up. And the test is structured in that that way. When you finish that test, they have a clear understanding of what you know and what you don't know. You can't hide. Mm -hmm. No. And the ASF fits is very much the same format because it was based on that. Yeah, it was incredible how much more I learned in that process. The A, B, and C, yeah, you have to have a certain amount of knowledge, but you also have to just be really good at taking tests. But the other one, when you're actually forced to explain it, it's amazing how that transfers to your sure. day-to-day work. And, well, for somebody like you especially. No, it, it changes it. And I feel it's a better way to assess the individual. Like I said, you leave there knowing what they know and what they don't know. But if you just ask somebody to sit down and take an 80-question multiple choice test, well, you don't fully know what they know and what they don't know. You never gave them a chance to explain or justify anything. And in this world, yeah, as you start to gain more knowledge, you can make an argument for a lot of things. There, There is still you know, a lot of things out there that are, are, are unknown. We just have theories on things and you know, being able to explain those, but it's extremely hard to do that on a multiple choice test. Yeah. Now, did you have somebody help you with the forging aspect when you're practicing it? Forging is my weaker side. Just wondered how you did that process. I'm kind of a hermit from that regard. And so I would just go make things and see what happened and then ask for feedback. And so I have or have people that I would commonly ask questions to. And I'll admit, you know, it's been so long ago. I took the AW in 2012, so I was preparing back in you know 2011, and I, I'll admit I, it's hard for me to remember exactly what I was doing back then. It seems like Mike Poe and Carl Vi have always been here, uh, close to me in in my my area, close to me in age, close to me in point of their career, and so. But the the two of them are extremely extremely good shoemakers, forgers, and so I'll admit I've I commonly will send a text or ask them you know, Hey, how, how do you do this? Or can you give me some pointers on this or that kind of thing? And I would imagine if I did have help at that point, that's where it came from. I'll admit I was totally, again, just blindly ignorant to the test. I'd read online the test, but I just went and took it. I didn't go to the prep clinics. I, I didn't really talk to anybody about how it's set up. I mean, just to show you what happened, I showed up and ready to shoe horses and holy jeans and a and a fleece like quarter zip. And I'll, I'll never forget it. Like <laughs> Mike and Jeremiah come around the corner and they're in suit and ties. And I thought, well, this is kind of funny. Are they just trying to be like suck ups? Are they like just trying to, you know, I mean, just to be frank, like kiss ass, like why, why are they dressed up? I thought it was funny. And then they were making fun of me. They're like, dude, you got to get today is the, was the written exam. And then they were like, you're supposed to be in a suit and tie. That is not written. That is not written <laughs> on the worst company's website. So I, I had no idea. And I thought they were right. The two of them, Jeremiah and Mike, they were just kind of screwing with me until I saw Mr. Billy Lewis come around the corner in a suit and tie. And I went, Oh crap. Yep. And then the oh, registrar no. came out and told me, you know, Hey, you're supposed to be in a suit and tie again. I just didn't know. And I'll never forget it. Cody Gregory went home, got a coat, and brought it back for me. And then I went, oh, cool. bought a suit and tie that night for the next, the oral exam part. Because there are on those English exams, a lot of unwritten rules that are not published on the site. I didn't know. The others that had gone to clinics or, or reached out and got, got help from, you know, Chris Gregory or, or whoever had been a part of the, those exams in the past, they were a leg up on me because they knew some of those things and I, I did not. So I wouldn't say my approach to those tests <laughs> were, were the best. I do think you <laughs> should reach out to people. You should get help. And, but for me, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Part of that's just kind of the way I'm built. I'm just going to go out and take a swing, see what happens. But, but I have right. learned over the years. And that's one of the things the associations have given me from, you know, North Carolina or the VHA or the really the AFA, the WCB, those things. They really do show you the benefit to a network and other fairs that can help you. 
And again, just like I said here sure. in the university, it's awesome to see all these experts in their particular field. Well, you go to those associations and you can find an expert on any part of Ferrier in it. If you want to learn how to make a fuller, you know, you can have access to Robert Jukes. If you want to to become a better forger, you can find people like Mike and Carl and Craig and people to help you. And I think that's the beauty of the association is to find those helps and make those associations, those those links. Yeah. For sure. Well, that's actually a pretty good segue. I was going to ask you about your term as a as the president of the AFA. Why did you want to do that in the first place, and and what was it like? Why would I want to do it? I I mean, I never set out my life as a goal to say, well, hey, I want to be president of the AFA. I want to want to do that. I I think what happened was I got a lot of help from the AFA. So again, I I mean, I didn't know how to make a shoe at all until I found the AFA certification somehow online or a book or something. And I, I wanted to go through that process. And I, I found a, a farrier in Raleigh that would help me named Andy Henderson and, and took my little shoe board over there. And he looked at it and told me we needed to work, but never made fun of me, never, never did anything. He just calmly set it down thankfully without having gone through every shoe in there, but he just sat him down. So we need to get to work. And then he, he proceeded to show me how to make a shoe, how to, how to pull a clip, how to make an egg bar. Like he, he really helped me get started in those things. And sure. I equate a lot of that to him personally, but I also equate a lot of it to the AFA and to the association that that particular point in my career, like if he would have been, you know, not nice to me or, or discouraging, I may have taken a totally different path. And to me, I look back and reflect and think I owe a lot to the AFA. So going through that certification, using the certification to, to be a part of, of getting this job, I would say Mike and Carl are two of my best friends in the world, but I met them through AFA events. You're going through certification. Like it's what really opened the door for, for me to meet and be exposed to a lot of other, other fairs and ideas. And so I feel like I owe a lot to the AFA. And I personally think all members of the AFA owe a lot to the AFA, but all the AFA is, it's not just this ivory tower or this entity that you don't know what is. The AFA is each individual person. And so each individual person has to give back. So whether you give back by being like Andy and helping somebody, uh, make the shoes or do the shoe board, or you give back by being an examiner, or you give back by being a clinician, or you give back by by being the, the treasurer, being the financer for the AFA, or you give back by being a board member, or you give back by being being president. I looked at it as an opportunity to try to pay back a small debt of what I owe to the, to the American Fairs Association. And again, when you look at the presidency and the, the leadership roles within those, those associations, everybody has a complaint, right? Everybody wants to pick at the leadership or, or the decisions or look at them and be critical. And I, I personally think if you, if you want to stand up and be critical, then you need to be willing to sit in the chair. Right. And so for me, I, I looked at it. I saw some things that I thought I could help with some directions I thought we as an association should go. And when you, you think like that, you have to be willing to sit in the seat. And so I, I think everybody should take a turn at filling in in some leadership role within, within the AFA, because again, everybody's different. They bring in different perspectives. They bring in new ideas. So me personally, I think there should be constant turnover in the leadership. I mean, within a three to five year window, like you need to have time to develop a course, to have a plan, implement things, but there does need to be constant turnover. Not one person gets a role in an office or a role as an examiner or a role as committee chair and then hold on to it for 10, 15, 20 years. (laughs) There needs to be a, be a turnover. And so I looked at it as a way for me to give back and right or wrong it, it, at the time it just appeared like it, it was my turn. I needed to take that job on for two years. And, and luckily I, I did it at a time in my life. Like I knew I was married. Obviously, I knew we wanted to have children, and I, that's one of the things that you, you know, now looking back, you definitely can't, or I shouldn't say you definitely can't, but it is very hard to do a good job as AFA president and have an infant in the house. So I really wanted to get it done before, <laughs> before that happened, and, uh, and luckily was able to. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you don't mind me asking, what were some of the things that you wanted to change? Like, what was it that inspired you to take that role? One of the first things, and, you know, if you go back and read the first letter I ever sent to the AFA, you know, membership, I, I thought a plan, just, just a general vision, write out some list of goals. Like I thought that was a, 
a step we needed to take. Like what, what are we going to accomplish? What are we going to set out to do? And, and there were several things I wanted to do. So one of the things I'll still get on the soapbox about is I think it is absolutely insane that a 50 year old organization does not have a foundation account with which to draw money from or get income for the general operating fund. And so the, the creation or the, the start of a, a foundation account to allow us to be, you know, the AFA is a 501c3, but you do need to have a separate foundation organization to be able to take uh, certain donations. So being the 501c3 that we are, a certain level of income has to be membership driven. But you could set up an, a second foundation account and another 501c3 that could pull in just donations. So, you know, Brian Mullins could donate $3,000 a year as a tax write-off to him, but donate it to the AFA, to the foundation account uh, to do that. Right. You know, I mean, I'll just say me because it's kind of morbid when you talk about it. But when you pass away, if you don't have people to leave things to, you know, you could leave part of your estate to the association it could grow and make sure it ensures the future success of the association beyond what is occurring now. So for me, I really wanted to bring that in. And that is something that uh, got voted on by the board approved and, and is becoming uh, fruition now. So when you're, you're president, a lot of the things that happened during that term aren't necessarily you. It takes a lot of time to, to get things through the board. Like I'll admit when I ran for AFA president, I thought I was signing up to be AFA dictator that I was just going to to tell everybody else <laughs> what we're going to do. And I was going to just take the reins and just, you know, whip the horse and do everything, just get it all done. But you are a part of a bigger team. It's really the board of directors that does run the association. And so you have to get everything through them. But again, back to what I wanted to accomplish was, was that I wanted to see the AFA certification tests updated, the written tests. Uh, oh, this was a big one. So develop and prove the professional relationships with other organizations like the WCB, the AAPF, the AAP, those type things. And, you know, I think we made some big strides to do that. I, I think, you know, there, we did a joint educational clinic up in New Hampshire with the AAPF president. Uh, I think that was awesome to work together. Uh, obviously, I mean, the WCB and the AFA are, they work great. That's a wonderful symbiotic relationship. You know, most members yeah. are members of both. And, you know, those two are, they work really, really well to together. You know, again, I wanted to see you know, reallocate funds to allow for improvements to communications and marketing. And so we did with the, the generous support uh, from, well, really from SoftRide. They helped uh, fund a, uh, a new booth to take to trade shows, things, things like that. Uh, clearly defining the role and responsibilities of the AFA executive director and ultimately uh, identifying and successfully recruiting the next uh, AFA director was big. So during my term, I knew that Miss Daniels, would leave. She had agreed to give the AFA five years and then she wanted to phase into to retirement and uh, and do other things. And so I knew there was going to be turnover. So making sure we selected the right individual as the new executive director was really important. Looking at trying to acquire sponsorship opportunities outside of the traditional ferry networks or companies is, is huge. So naturally anybody can look at the ferry industry and see that things are consolidating. You know, obviously you know, mm -hmm. from Delta Mustad joining to Vet Tech, you know, now being distributed out of FPD, those things, the, the pots are getting smaller and smaller every day. And so looking outside of our industry was, was huge. I really wanted to see electronic voting uh, come about. And so that is in place now. So uh, starting with the elections next year, you'll be allowed to do that electronically rather than just the written ballot. Uh, I really wanted to see presentations and ceremonies, recognition of each candidate that completes certification. I wanted them to be recognized at convention. And now if you go, it is a big, big part of it now. So it started out as uh, everybody that was there that successfully completed any part of certification was recognized and walked across the stage at the general membership meeting. But now it's part of the grand finale, the banquet. So right there with your idols, when you see the AFT named, when you see the, the winners of the contest, you also get to see each person that completed part of certification that is in attendance. They walk across the stage and and are recognized, there's a chance to, to cheer them on and, and really appreciate their endeavors and going through that certification process. So that was certainly a, a really big one. Yeah, that's cool. It seems, uh, you know, kind of a mute point at the moment, but increasing the global footprint of the AFA and AFA certification. Sure, with the whole COVID crisis, international travel has stopped, but expanding, looking at expanding, you know, our cultural exchange opportunities, where the AFT goes, where, where we could potentially have certifications outside the borders of the, 
the U.S. is huge. I mean, the world is getting smaller every day with things like social media, podcasts, like people are, are being reached from around the, the country uh, that at one time weren't, or around the world, really, not just the country, but at one time that weren't. So the AFA would be foolish not to investigate the increasing their global footprint. So those type things, like, were the big ones. That's really cool. I've often wondered with the creation of the AAPF, now I know that their vision is different. It's definitely less focused on foraging and, and there's like a different direction for them. Did the AFA perceive them as competition or was that the whole point of this joint effort just to demonstrate that you guys are all in this kind of together? I think some of that was mine or, or a group of, of people within the AFA and the AAPF. That was part of our vision was to show that we do do two quite different things. So, you know, just right or wrong, the AFA offers certification. I mean, let's be honest. That's the that's the crown jewel. That's the big thing that the AFA focuses on. And then the big thing that the AAPF wants to focus on is tracking continuing education events, right? Showing that you're, yeah. you as a member of that association believe in continuing education. And so there is room there for a great symbiotic relationship. And, and so, sure, I mean, I'd be lying if I told you there weren't people in the AFA that, that see the AAPF as competition. Of course they do. I mean, right. it's another another association of of farriers, and and in reality, a lot of them were you know past leaders of the AFA that had now gone on to start start another another organization kind of thing. So sure, there was some bad feelings and some some history and some things there, but in reality, like I mean, just looking at it, you you just can't change the past. So all we can do, they're they're here, they're there now. They may uh, bring in different different members. There's a lot of people that are members of both associations. And at the end of the day, they're one of my, my visions. And one of the things that I think the fair industry should focus on are there, there are much larger scale problems or issues that we need to address as an entire fair profession. So sure we can have all these different associations that, that do things, but at, at the end of the day, you know, there are bigger issues like uh, licensing and regulation or uh, health care or health insurance, those type of things that we just need to look at as farriers, not just one association. It's too much for one association to take on. I personally think there is a lot of room for the associations to work together. But uh, again, there's always going to be people that view the other organizations as competition or, or problems. And that's always been the case. I mean, there's, you know, since the AFA, you know, then there's the, the guild, there's the brotherhood, there's the WCB, there's the AAPF, there's all the state chapters. Like there's plenty of other associations that are out there, but I just like, you know, any other fair walking down the street, you can view them as competition or you can look at them as your friend, your colleague. And so I, yeah. you know, and yeah. the, in reality, the answer is they are both, but mm-hmm. You know, there are plenty of horses in this world. There are plenty of fairies in this world. They might as well (laughs) just work together. There's no point in, you know, there's always that that big statement out there. You don't make your candle shine brighter by blowing out someone else's. Me, I just think if the AAPF and the WCB, they go out, they become very successful, then that's just going to raise the the water for everybody. I mean, it raises the entire tide. So it makes life better for the AFA as well. Yeah. That's just the way I view it. No, I come from a very similar vein and uh, perspective, so... I, I like the way you put that it, when you give the example of, of a farrier, because, yeah, we, we have that situation and some of our best friends are our competition. <laughs> Absolutely. All day. In reality. But all it is, I mean, the AAPF is just, well, hell, it's just whatever, 500 of them. They're still mm-hmm. just farriers. They're still doing the same thing you do every day. So Yeah, exactly. Now, what do you think of the whole licensing thing? Do you think that as a profession, we should work towards that? I'm torn. So I, you know, I probably get to give a more honest answer now than when I was AFA president, but me, yes, the Travis Burns view on life as I, I see a lot of benefits to licensing and regulation and a, uh, a controlled structured educational system. I think, well, just like you, you've inter- interviewed a lot of fairs for this podcast and they all have a different route there. So I do think, yeah. you know, life, if we could make a nice streamlined system to help people become farriers, I do think that would be beneficial to the profession and ultimately beneficial to the welfare of the horse, which is what we're all all in this for. So I do think that, that it could help from that that regard. I do think it could help eliminate some of the the people that just go out and become farriers. They just start trimming and shoeing horses kind of unregulated without knowledge. 
But again, I'd be lying if I didn't look back at myself and say, well, I mean, I was that person. Yeah. I went down to the farmer's co-op, and bought diamond toe and heel, and I went nailing it on. <laughs> so part of me like appreciates the people that do do that. But I, I do think people could go further quicker if there was a structured structured system. So I do see a lot of the benefits uh, to it. Um, and then obviously, I mean, again, I mean, I'm a pretty conservative person and government regulation does scare me. You know, I don't know that I really want the government having any more control over my business than they, they already do. You know, and anytime you get into yeah. licensing and regulation, you're going to have to have more taxes. You're going to have to pay people to run the exams. You're going to have to pay people to run the registry, uh, to keep track of it. You're going to have to pay people to be a part of the disciplinary action, the review committees, those, those type things. So it would obviously increase the, the, the cost of each individual proprietor and their business. They're going to have to pay more to have a licensing and regulation system. Mm -hmm. So I, I could talk myself into either way, really. I don't know that I have a strong, it's got to go one way or the other. Okay. No, and that's an interesting perspective because you are somebody who started out the one way and then no. pursued it to the complete opposite end yeah. with all those certifications. A lot to consider there. No kidding. Well, and uh, thanks for trudging into those deeper waters with me because you're in the position you are now that you don't have to worry about saying the wrong thing. Did you find yourself really having to watch what you said and did in representing all farriers? Yeah, yes and no. So I think, you know, whenever you take the one of those roles of leadership, you have to give up some of your individuality at that point. You have to start yeah. thinking what is best for the entire profession? What is best for the association? Not necessarily what is best for Travis Burns or or what ideals do I have? You have to realize that you're representing membership within your association that are, you know, from a, across the spectrum. You know, I mean, you just start from men and women and then you start from forging handmade people to keg shoes to industry suppliers to barefoot trimmers to people who glue on everything, people that hand make everything. Like you, you take on a role bigger than yourself and you have to represent, I think, you know, the fair profession as a whole. So you do, I do think you lose some of your individuality in those times, but I do think as, as an AFA leader to get people to respect you and, and accept you as a leader is you do have to be willing to make a decision and, and, and stand on your own and, and do be you. Like you can't be this amorphous chameleon type that just agrees with whoever <laughs> they're talking to. Yep. They have to know what you stand for and what you believe, but they also have to trust that you will represent and try to make the best decision for the entire group. Not that you're just going to listen to your ideas or you're going to going to press those upon others. You know, there are people again, I mean, on the board that would challenge me. Like I said, I, I thought I was signing up to be an AFA dictator. Like I really did think it was just going to be the Travis Burns show, but you do have to, to accept that there are other ideals out there and other perspectives out there. And, and luckily I, I had a lot of people on the board or several individuals that were willing to challenge, you know, my ideas. I couldn't just stand up and say, well, I think this is great. And this is the way we should go. You know, I would have somebody stand up and say, well, not only why, but also give me historical perspective and also give me a different viewpoint and, and make me listen to it. And, and so I do think as AFA president, you do have to dance around probably gives it a bad connotation, but you do have to, to be open-minded and willing to see uh, different viewpoints. And at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're still a human, you're still an individual. So you just have to make the best decision you can for, for the entire profession or the entire association. That's really cool. So I do think you do lose some individuality, but yeah. Interesting. This portion of the podcast is called the Stratum Tectorium. These are the short answer, surface stuff questions, but it's okay if the guest wants to go deeper. Enjoy. Do you have a favorite book? Like non fair related book? It can be either. Are you a reader? Uh, well, I am now, but I'm reading different books now. So I'd say I've been reading a lot of The Very Hungry Caterpillar lately. It's a, that's a little children's book. So I read that to, to my daughter a lot. Yeah hanging out. But so, so reading has changed. You know, I'll admit I used to sit around and read a lot of <laughs> textbooks and journal articles like those. I enjoy reading. I've never really been one to sit and read fiction and, and things like that. I've never really been that type of person. So I, I do read some things like, uh, well, the last one I remember reading before Maddie's arrival was uh, Hillbilly Elegy. 
and it's about a, a guy that grew up in uh, rural Appalachia uh, between Kentucky and Ohio. And I grew up in rural Appalachia in North Carolina. So it was very similar to home to me. And it kind of talks about his, his journey in life from, you know, rural Appalachia to law school at, I believe it was Yale, either Yale or Princeton, one of the Ivy league schools. He put himself through, through school there and got out and it really talks about uh, the culture there and, and viewpoints from that. So that was a really good one. Wow. Yeah. I saw that on the shelf. It intrigued me, but I'd never picked it up to read what it was actually about. Oh, it's a good one. Okay. Good to know now. Do you have a favorite brand of work boots? Oh, no, I'm not a boot wearer. So I wear a uh, little like hiking shoes, either Keens or I shoe and Nikes. Do you? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I've never, never been a boot, steel toe, big, heavy boot. Nah, that's never been me. I shoe and the lightest thing I can put on my feet. Okay. Do you have a favorite make of rasp? I do. I used to be, you know, diehard save edge, but I've moved into more of uh, like the Balada prime levels or what's the, the green one? Heller or something. Oh yeah, the green yep, tang. The green one's a good one. Yep. Yeah. Most people respond with that one. Yeah, but I do like that. The Berlotta Prime level is a really good one too. Let's see. Uh, okay. One of the twos in the box always. Yeah. I haven't tried that one. Do you have a dream farrier rig or maybe it's just a dream farrier shop? Absolutely I do. Five thousand square feet would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh do you have a favorite rounding hammer that you use? I use, an, and I do think it is my favorite from historically, but it is one of those, uh, I don't know how he describes them, but the the newer Jim Poor ones, the ones with, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like it's a longer head and they're kind of fuller on the end and he has his little Tuscola T on it. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, the little two and a quarter gotcha. pound one. Yeah. Okay. I like that, that T from Tuscola. So it's a little known fact. There are two Tuscola high schools in the U.S. and I went to one of them. So I think it's really cool to to see that little logo for Tuscola. <laughs> it's a Cherokee word. And I grew up right on the Cherokee Indian reservation right beside it. So oh, okay. I think it's, it's really cool. There's a lot of significance there. Yeah. Do you have a favorite type of bar stock to work with? I do. I mean, I, I would say my favorite is probably three, eight by seven, eights. It's hard. It's hard to find. I have to get it out of North Carolina, but I, it's my favorite rather than trying okay. to draw down three, eight by one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite pastime after work? Right now, nowadays, it's uh, uh, my wife and, and I, we like to walk on. There's a little trail here called the Huckleberry Trail. It's a paved uh, trail between Blacksburg and Christiansburg. It's like, uh, um, I don't know, a 10-mile thing. Uh, we like to walk on it. Okay. That's a lot of fun. You know, I like to hike and, and fish and do those type things, but, but life's obviously obviously changing. But yeah. the walks on the Huckleberry are a lot of fun. Okay. And actually that was one thing that I, I had thought of because you've done so many things and, and it sounds like you're still doing so many things. How did you prioritize your time? Oh, like you must have to say no a lot. No, I'm not good at saying no. So what, no, what happened? Okay. No, you'll, you'll see me. It's like, I live in this world of what I call controlled chaos. So <laughs> I am happiest when there are a lot of things going on. I'm happiest when there are four horses in the fair shop and a vet's working on one and uh, the apprentice is working on another one and I'm working on one and then there's one waiting. Like I, I like chaos. If I don't have 10,000 things to do, it's hard. Well, I, would, I mean, I'll just be honest. It's hard for me to be around me and it's really hard for other people to be around me. <laughs> I have to have a lot to do. I don't, I don't sit idly by very well. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And again, I don't know that I've always prioritized the, the, the best that I should have, you know, looking back, there's some things I wish, I wish I would have prioritized like the AFA cultural exchange. You know, I let that, that get by me in life. You know, once you have a mortgage, a family, a a faculty job, it's really hard to do that type thing. But looking back, I wish I I could have prioritized some other things uh, better to get them, to get them done at specific times in, in life. But you can't change the past. You can't. Nope, no sense to worry about it. Now I just tell everybody else, go do it. Come tell me about it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Take, take pictures and send it to me. Yeah. Yeah. What's the next thing on your bucket list? Oh, uh, next thing on my bucket list, uh, fair wise. Uh, one day again, I, I would like to make the AFT some point in my life. I think that would be a lot of fun. I think the, uh, the doors it opens and the opportunities that the members of that team get to get to explore and experience is, is wonderful. So yeah, fair wise, I would say that's, that's one of the, the top things on my bucket list. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm sure this has changed from the, uh, diamond toe, but, uh, the favorite brand of keg shoe. 
Oh, yeah. Well, you'd be surprised. I still bet this day if you were to actually keep track of how many shoes I've nailed on, I bet you I've still nailed on more diamond toe and heel than anything. Really? <laughs> Yeah, I spent a lot of years doing a lot of horses with those, but I my favorite my favorite brand now for sure is Kirkhart by far and away. Okay, not even close to me. Leather or synthetic pads? Uh, when you say synthetic, you mean like a pouring urethane, or you mean like a plastic pad? Uh, either. Oh hell, yeah. I'm pla- I'm plastic pad all day. Are you really? Yep, I hate leather <laughs> with a patch. And why is that? Oh, I can't stand the fact that it moves. It it expands and contracts, and clinches can pop and. And I, I don't like having to soak them to nail them on just to lessen that. I don't like the the leather wedge pads lose their, their thickness. They lose their degree over the course of a shoeing cycle. I, I just I just like plastic. Hmm. You're probably the second guest to ever say oh, yeah. synthetic. Yeah, yeah. No, I bet you I haven't nailed on a leather pad in, oh gosh, at least five years, I bet. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you have a favorite type of horse to work on other than a good one? Uh, a favorite type of horse. I, I do, you know, based on my background, my, my favorite is still a three day event horse. Like I, I think that is a, a really good test of a, a horse's uh, athletic ability. And, and certainly when we are still running long formats, I, I think that's a remarkable athlete. And I think that's a wonderful way to be a part of a team. So I, I do still like shoeing three day event horses. And, and in that I would pick the, the bigger warm bloods over the, <laughs> the off the track thoroughbred. But, <laughs> yeah. 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 I would be with you on that one too. Yeah. Would you have an ideal number of horses to shoe all around in one day? I know this might not be as applicable in your scenarios. It doesn't really fit in my program here now, but uh, I would say, I don't know, somewhere four to five, maybe four. Yeah. I like symmetry. So two before lunch and two after. Yeah. There you go. Be good. Yeah. Do you have a favorite anvil? Uh, I do. Scott Anvils with, without a doubt. I think they're, okay. they're excellent. A great company. Cool. Do you have a favorite inspirational quote? Well, the nice one is, uh, be who you are. Uh, say what you think. Those that, uh, matter won't mind. Those that mind don't matter. <laughs> Probably my favorite, but I like the shortened one, you know, well, actually I'm looking at all my computer screen right now. It says wolves don't lose sleep over the opinion of sheep. <laughs> They mean the same, but one's a little, probably a little nicer. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I, I think people, you should just be you in this world. There's no point in trying to be anyone else. I like that one. I haven't heard that before. Do you have an app that's most improved your work life? Probably, I guess, just the, the calendars, the, the Outlook programs. Yeah. Would, are probably my, yeah. Okay. And do you have a preferred social media platform? No, I hate them all. Without okay. Them. Yeah. <laughs> no. I shouldn't say that. So I, I mean, again, obviously if you, you know me or see me, if you're friends of Facebook or Instagram or any of those things, like I'm not very active, but I, I do think they have opened the world to, a uh, or the individual to a lot of things around the world. So I think there is a lot of, a lot of good from the social media platforms. I think it's done a lot of good to the fair industry, but I think it is also, it, it points out some of the extremists in this world and it it gives people platforms to to say things and do things that they they maybe wouldn't in real life so um, yeah I think if people would only be sober when they're on social media and only say or do things on social media that they would say or do to someone's face I think that they could be markedly improved but but I yeah I think there's a lot of there's a lot of good that comes out of them but there's a lot of bad that comes out of them too there's something about being able to hide behind a screen that makes people pretty brave. Anonymity makes them really brave and really strong and, and experts in their field, for sure. <laughs> Do you have a favorite method of soothing aches and pains? Just being honest, yes. Uh, uh, Crown and Ginger Ale does a wonderful job. There you go. <laughs> and I think that's a Canadian brand, too. It is. Do you have a favorite brand of jeans? I wear Wrangler, I guess. Is what I got home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, favorite drink? I think we just covered that. Yep, Crown Ginger <laughs> with a like quarter of a lemon in it. Favorite genre of music? I don't know how you would describe it. Like I, I like uh, kind of this like bluegrassy type country. Yep. I don't know. Not like the new like poppy country, but kind of that mix. Keith Whitley, Alison Krauss, Union right. Station, that kind of thing. Jerry Douglas. Okay. Are you an old Crow Medicine Show fan? Absolutely. Wagon Wheel is one of my favorite songs. Okay, cool. Talks about everywhere I've lived from Raleigh, Roanoke, Knoxville. I've lived <laughs> in all those places. So <laughs> It might Everyone, be about yeah. you. Yeah. No, I love those guys. Uh, do you work out? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, do you meditate? Yeah. 
to a certain degree. Like I don't sit and, and, uh, you know, get in weird positions and light incense or anything like that. But I, uh, you know, I think that's probably why I like those walks on the Huckleberry with, with my wife is that is a nice calming time. You know, we don't take cell phones with us. There's, you know, I mean, we don't really talk about work or anything. It's just, you're just walking, pushing a baby. That's a, that's a good way to relax and calm down. Sounds pretty nice. Yeah. What do you think you would have been if you weren't a farrier? Oh, I would have been a lumberjack for sure. Really? Yeah. I love cutting, cutting trees, cutting and stacking. Well, the people that know me will get a kick out, but stacking firewood is my, probably one of my favorite things to do, like creating a pattern. And I don't know. I just like to stack firewood. <laughs> huh. Yeah. That might be a first for me to hear. Yeah. Without a doubt. And maybe still one day. All right. Yeah. Well, it's never too late. Mm-hmm. If you were stuck in a shop with a farrier because of COVID for like a month, who, who would you pick? Oh, that's an easy question. Russ Height, without a doubt. Yeah. Number one okay. person. Yep. No, he is. If you don't know that man, he is one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. He should absolutely <laughs> be the next person you interview. Really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, he's not a, he's not a big famous name. Well, he does. Well, I guess a lot of people wouldn't know him. He, he runs buddy aprons, but he, he is the best storyteller and just, I mean, just a riot. Like I, I love, love to see his name pop up on my phone. Yeah. Th- those people are great. Uh, well, there's, a whole list of names that you uh, mentioned on this that I feel like they're all people I should probably be talking to. Yeah. It's an honor to be able to sit here and do this with you. I I really appreciate all your insight on all this stuff. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity.